Well, this is our stirring conversation, folks. <laughs> Next caller. <laughs> well, it was it was legitimately interesting, but then we had yeah, to. Until, you know, until we had to share the conversation with everybody else, then yeah. it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yes, hi, Velcro. I see you. I think Katie's been inducted to our little club because she's been helping us out a lot on After Effects and whatnot. In fact, I think we're. She had a uh, After Hours with Mel, and she's going to have one with us pretty soon. So. Hooray! There's hope, there's hope for you all. You guys <laughs> just have to. You guys just have to, you know, pay to get in our good graces. <laughs> <laughs> Continue paying. I'm still paying. <laughs> We well, didn't say you had to, but... You know, I know, well, I want to. It's fun. It's fun. The best kind of fan. <laughs> the one who just keeps giving. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, Katie has been helping us out a ton on um, getting wasted efforts off the ground and uh, helping us with a little bit with the art here and there. And So, uh, yeah, awesome. Woohoo! Yeah, I'm actually, and, right now, I'm working on the After Effects things for you guys. Like, at this moment, right now, it's happening. Woo. Yes, woo. <laughs> All right, so which of you two lovely people between Velcro and Andrew would like to jump in and join us? Well, it depends on if they have anything to contribute to the conversation. Not that the conversation yes, that's that going on right now is riveting or anything, but... <laughs> if not, we can start a conversation and they can jump in, but uh, that's we were true. thinking about talking about E3 mm -hmm. because that's always so relevant <laughs> yeah, and if anybody was wondering about the conversation we were having before we went live, we were actually uh, discussing Konami and their potential jump to mobile games and or gambling. Fuck Konami. Wrap their ass. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. Fucking Konami. I can't believe they're doing that shit. Castlevania and Silent Hill, and they're like, you know what? We're just going to make mobile games. Fuck that. We want the we want the pay-to-play shit, because apparently that's a fucking gold mine. Never mind making quality shit. Now they're just going to make shit. Yep, exactly. Now we're going to, like like Max says, now we're going to do the alley, alley card dress-up where you got to buy, like, outfits for them. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll, be, it'll be like, you know, uh, uh, Symphony of the Night, just, you know, um, more expensive. Fuck. And the less fun, of course. Yes, of course. You can go shopping with alley card <laughs> and do all that... Uh, what the hell yeah. is that... Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll also what, what be... Was it? it's, it's not Yuri. It's the other one, right? Yeah, we, oh, God. That's yeah. it. They'll make a dating sim. I was literally trying to think of that one comic where Deadpool is, like, uh, hanging on to Spider-Man. Oh, <laughs> he's, yeah. like, he's like, some fans, they call this Yaoi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And as far as uh, Katie's comment regarding a dating sim... Um, that's actually terrifying because what I remembered is that the, I think that's like a visual gag we did in uh, one of our earlier CCS podcasts. That that's like the next direction for the Silent, Silent Hill series. Yeah, the Silent Hill dating sim. Oh yeah. God, really? Oh shit! Oh no! Yeah. And I found like a you know hentai image of like one of the nurses, and uh, I basically recreated the interface of a typical dating sim, and she's like saying, you know, fucking James Coon. Yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting for you, senpai, and so, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, siren as well. Let me mute my mic here. Yes, mute your freaking mic. But um, Max, did you send out the invite to anybody yet? No, because I haven't seen anyone worthy of joining this uh, conversation. <laughs> well, so Andrew Ryan just said, "Well, I want to talk about E3 and Mad Max." Uh, we'll let you talk about Mad Max, but I'm going to see that tonight. So if you spoil anything, I will block your ass forever. <laughs> Ooh, this is gonna be a nice short conversation. You guys might actually make it to this whole entire like. Uh, what are we gonna call this? Our best of Patreon thing. We're actually gonna start like releasing some videos of these chats because some of them are pretty good. We yeah, should. some of them have been pretty good. Yeah, Most of the ones with me in it. It's more know. revenue. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but also then it will help. You know, like fuck the message, man. It's all about them dead presidents. Like, well, yeah, but then people who aren't giving to the Patreon be like, wow, we are missing out on so much, and then you know <laughs> you're missing out on laughing man just being a complete cantankerous asshole today. <laughs> Well, but people love that. No, they like when Max it's does it. They, like, charm, they, they right? just want to hear me cackle like a he <laughs> You know. <laughs> that that's always. Sweet. It, it, it's like it's like someone actually posted. I think it might have been Gremlin posted up on our uh, iTunes account that I used to like mm -hmm. Cinemax, and I heard Laughing Man laugh, and now he's my favorite. I'm like, wow, <laughs> thanks. That's uh. That's I, all that's the substance there is to you. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That, that, that's that's exactly what I got. I'm like, you know, thanks for you know me being your number one person now, but um, mm-hmm. uh, apparently it's not from what I'm saying. It's just the other horrible noises coming out of my yap. Yeah, I love crazy. Laughing Man. He's like a low rent version of Rich Evans. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you gotta do it right. Jesus. <laughs> So, Andrew, what do you have for us today? <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought maybe my Sorry. fucking internet like crapped out again. Nah, no. Nah. So, what All you right. got for us, dude? Well, well, you said you wanted to talk about E3, but first I wanted to talk about um, Mad Max and um, Laugh Man. You already said you haven't seen it yet. Uh, have Katie or Cinemax? Have you seen it yet? No, I, I don't go for that kind it. of smut myself. <laughs> no, I, ha- I haven't been able to go to the movies lately. I've been pretty busy, so I have not seen it either. But I know a lot. I, I've been hearing a lot of the uh, drama surrounding it and stuff, so, um, you know, we, 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 we can still talk about that. Well, I won't spoil anything. Um, it was really surprisingly good. Like, I was surprised. I didn't go in with very high expectations, but I came out pleasantly surprised. Um, it's definitely one of those movies that satisfies your inner 12-year-old with all the explosions and, you know, the car chases and stuff like that. It was Pleasantly satisfying. Um, however, what I really wanted to talk about was, you know, the whole kind of feminist uh, blaring about how MRAs were boycotting the film. Yes, the torrent of misinformation that was up in the air recently, we've yeah. heard. And that's, I mean, that's the best way to describe it is misinformation, because as far as I could find, there wasn't really any MRAs that were... Boycotting it? I mean, it was just like, uh, what was it? It was... It was a website Return called of Return of the Kings, yeah. yes, which is not officially affiliated with uh, men's rights movements. Um, yeah, well, also... Other articles say that, I mean, they, they're against it to an extent. Uh, which, you know, is their right, but it doesn't mean that there's this massive all-across-the-board uh, boycott going on. Um, and, you know, what this entire situation does, it basically exemplifies everything that's wrong with uh, online journalism these days. Not just gaming journalism for once, but all of online journalism. But that's the fact that uh, they're no longer in the business of reporting news. They're in the business of creating, or in this case, fabricating news. No um, journalism. Make sensationalist headlines. Yay, of course. And the most egregious... want to see through the lens of their, uh, their politics... Of course, and the most outrageous part about this is the fact that uh, the gentleman who wrote the original article, I forget his name, not that it really matters, but still, uh, after he had posted his, you know, misinformed piece, uh, both Return for Kings and A Voice for Men, who is, which is like, the you know, the biggest hub for MRA activity on the internet, both of them have come out and contacted the guy and said, like, um, actually, Return of Kings is not an MRA website, and the vo- and you know the MRAs came out and said, like, yeah, they're not associated with us, and instead, and Don't there was any of that. <laughs> oh, inside jokes. Uh oh, but anyways, um, and in the, as far as the original author goes, instead of saying, oh, excuse me, I didn't know, let me just amend the article really quick, he instead basically decided to dismiss. Facts. He decided to dismiss reality and say, eh, to me you're all alike, so I'm going to keep the article. And it's like, what the fuck? Wow, yeah, like, no. so I actually hadn't heard about that that last bit. That Wow, that, yeah. that, that, that's, that's fucking crazy. Yeah, the deliberate, deliberate um, uh, misinformation just spreading. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why this misinformation is happening is because for the past couple of months or even years, I suppose, at this point, uh, the the hashtag progressive side has basically slowly but steadily been showing their true uh, puritanical slash authoritarian colors by trying to boycott various stuff like uh, obviously the bad girl cover or, uh, you know, the recent controversy with Joss Whedon and his portrayal of the Black Widow in Avengers 2, or the Fable Girl during uh, hashtag National Cleavage Day, etc., etc. So basically, the progressive uh, media, what they were doing is they were, tr- they were waiting for uh, the other side, the MRAs, to commit some sort of faux pas so that they can expose them and go, ah, see, they're just as bad as us. Which is why the original author was so trigger happy 
to completely misrepresent what happened and uh, uh, you know announce that the return of kings it was just MRAs and there's this massive boycott going on. When, when in reality, well, first of all, if Return of Kings, if that website doesn't want to watch the movie, fine, because they have a right to do so. Um, and if, believe you me, if that's what the feminists did with something like uh, the Bad Girl cover, if they said that, hey, we're not going to financially support, we're not going to buy this issue because we don't agree with the, cover, with the choice of cover and whatnot, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But the problem is no they didn't wallets. stop there. They didn't Exactly, but the problem is they didn't stop there. They didn't say, I do not agree with this, and therefore I'm not going to financially support it. Instead, because they didn't like it, they decided to take it upon themselves to dictate to DC uh, that, you know, this is horrible, this is offensive, this is sexist, and therefore you should take it down. No one should be able, no one should be exposed to this kind of filth. And it's like, fuck you. You know, even if, even Return of Kings... Even if Return of Kings, this website doesn't like Mad Max, they have a right to do it. You know, even if they have decided to actually boycott the movie, they're boycotting it themselves. They're not, you know, petitioning. They're not starting a hashtag to not trying to get taken down so no one else can watch it. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I, f I feel like the whole debacle between the MRAs and the feminists is almost like watching two children bigger with each other, with the society being the stress out of the adult in the middle and trying to figure out who to appease. You spank them well to be on fucking rooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, again, I'm not seeing the MRAs uh, consistently trying to ban everything they don't like, so I wouldn't say they're the opposite of feminists in this case. Well, maybe the philosophy probably is, but as far as the, pra the practice, I mean, if somebody wants to, make that no, a lot of them, a lot of them are more traditional as guys. It's not misogyny. It's not about superiority. Even it's more about collaboration, from what I've read. So you can't even say that. Oh, you know, there are two sides of the. It's the same fallacy people commit with Gamergate. Well, they're not jobs on both sides. Yeah, but you know, I would say there are more not jobs on the anti side than on the pro well, side. You could say the same thing about the feminism too, because feminism has two different extremes. There's people out there who are, um, you know, pro characters like Bayonetta in video games because it's you know power. It's it's a powerful image. You know, uh, a gal who's confident and sexy versus like people like Anise Sarkeesian. Bring her up again. Who uh, look at them and they say, "Oh, it's just a male fuck toy fantasy," and you know this type of stuff should be taken down. And it's like, uh. well, thankfully the movie's doing well, and like I said, the uh, Return of Kings has not been petitioning to whoever the publisher of the movie is, Paramount Universal, I don't know, and trying to sabotage the movie and ruin it for everyone else. So even if they don't want to watch it, by all means, it's their choice. Yeah, same thing with you know. Uh, Atheists might not want to watch, you know, certain Christian films and vice versa, so it's, uh, you vote with your dollar. That's free market principles 101. If you agree with something, you, you know, you support with your money, and if you don't, then you just let it go. Simple, huh? Yeah, I'm just waiting for anyone else to chime in, otherwise it sounds like a circle Katie. Going on. <laughs> No, I well, I don't know enough about this particular topic to really chime in, but um, I definitely have agreed with uh, what you guys have been talking about. You know, that's basically it. If you don't like it, then don't you know, don't go and see it. Don't try and and cry about it. Well, nobody should see this because I don't like it. It's like you're a fucking child. You know, grow up. Yeah, I mean, this is what religious groups have done in the past. I mean, you know, like Monty Python, the Life of Brian. Everyone's like, oh my God, blasphemy, and you know they. You just have to, uh, you know, let let it play out. And if you don't like it, you don't have to go watch it. But they were trying to censor Life of Brian, saying we're going to make sure that you know we we uh, picket theaters and we're going to demand that you know certain our hometown doesn't bring the this filth to our hometown, that kind of stuff. And uh, even in England, uh, that exact same thing was on a much larger scale, of course, because you know country of origin. But people, what what they were doing was they were organizing like bus parties to go to the next town over to watch it. <laughs> so it's it's uh, again it comes down to the free mar the free market um, the fact that you know you can vote with your dollar and uh, nobody should have any type of authority to say what what you can can't watch I mean if you uh, want to watch you know um, something that maybe Roger Ebert thought is morally reprehensible like a Friday Thirteenth movie that's your fucking choice you don't have to have one person tear down uh, an entire art form um, just because it doesn't doesn't uh, mesh well with their worldview. So, yep. I think yeah, I what think was interesting about the 
the MRI, well, they weren't MRI, was just the, the Return of Kings article about the Mad Max films, they didn't really have any sort of, you know, good reason. I mean, at least in the case of, like, picketing and trying to boycott um, Life Brian, you know, these Max, fix your really... fucking, Max, fix your fucking microphone, you're knocking shit over. <laughs> <laughs> They were, um, <laughs> they were protesting, you know, something that they held as a deeply religious belief. But so far, all I could see from the Return of King article was basically he was just complaining that Charlize Theron, who was playing Imperator Furiosa, he was saying that simply because she's playing a strong female character lead in the movie, that it's feminist propaganda. But that also leads into the idea that um, I, I forget her name, but they brought the woman who was the director and the writer of the Vagina Monologues. I think that's like a play or something like that. But they brought yeah, I've heard the same thing. They brought her on as a consultant. Yeah, as a, as a consultant. And I honestly don't think, personal point of view, I can't spoil anything, but I thought the movie was amazing in um, portraying strong female characters. I mean, it wasn't feminist in the way that you would think modern feminism is. It was just more of saying, hey, look... Here's all of this violence, and um, people, uh, women can be just as effective in men in stressful situations like this. I, I didn't see it as feminist at all. It was just it was just a good action movie from what I've read. So yeah, and to to look too deep into oh well, it's a female protagonist. Uh, that 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 kind of gets under my skin a bit because it's it, it's almost the exact opposite as saying you know oh this female protagonist is too sexy or something. And it's like uh, it, I guess uh, the, the sex the sex of the character shouldn't have as much to do with what the character's doing, how well the character's written, uh, etc. So, yeah, I agree. It shouldn't be the focal point, basically, the sex of a character. Oh, uh, she's you know, uh, she's the the lead in this Mad Max movie. From kind of what I heard, she takes she takes a lot of the lead in this, yeah, uh, which Mad is fine. Is, yeah, I'm kind of. I mean, they're both the main characters, but for the first like third of the movie, Max is like a complete bystander to everything that's happening. <laughs> Of course, he's that way in most of the previous Mad Max movies, too. Max has always been kind of just like a catalyst to this world, um, kind of like uh, the audience looking through his eyes to see, you know, Barter Town and the Thunderdome and, you know, um, the, the outpost inside of Road Warrior. He, he's always been kind of just like the, ob the observer uh, early on. Then he gets swept up in what's going on, again, going back to uh, Road Warrior. Where he literally just watches the pe what, what's going on for like the first third of the movie, and finally you know gets involved and you know becomes a hero out of it. So, and I think that's what a lot of people didn't recognize about the new film when they complained about that because I mean, you know, it, those films were a lot older. I mean, nineteen eighties and nineties is when they came out, so they're a little more dated. And I'm pretty sure a large amount of the fan base who went to see uh, Fury Road hadn't seen the first three movies, and if they, the ones who had appreciated that they kept up with the kind of, you know, archetype of how Max was in the movie. Oh, absolutely. And, um, uh, like you said, uh, it's, it's always outsiders looking in who seem to misconstrue everything. I mean, uh, the Batgirl cover, again, kind of comes to mind. The um, People who uh, want to raise a shit fit either one way or the other are usually people who have never really given that particular IP any type of attention. So what were you, uh, Andrew, what were you thinking of talking about with E3? Or did you just want to talk about just general stuff? Was there anything in particular that you wanted to discuss? Um, we could start at the top. I mean, there's, there's a lot of aspects of E3 2015 that are going to be relatively interesting um, to discuss. So if you guys want to start it with a topic, I can just jump in when I hear something that you know, I've thought about, because there's a lot at E3 that I still have to look into. Well, I actually did some uh, research yesterday because I was, for the most part, out of the loop of what, you know, the buzz is this year about E3. So I decided to hit a lot of the, uh, you know, major mainstream gaming publications like IGN and Destructoid, and needless to say, a lot of them uh, have a bunch of clickbait articles saying like top things we're looking forward to this year, you know, for this year's E3 and whatnot. Of course, that's the other half of journalism these days is clickbait statements. Top yeah, so addressed. yeah, pretty much. So I decided to browse through most of them, and I was appalled because a lot of them, a lot of these lists, kind of illustrate, uh, like I said, the other, the other coin, the other side of the coin with uh, gaming journalism. Because if they're not being 
ultra liberal, you know, gun home is the game of the year. This is the way all games should be in the future. If they're not doing that, then they're basically being corporate shills because 90% of those of the aforementioned lists were holy shit, we want to see another Call of Duty game or we want to see another Gears of War game or another Need for Speed game. Or it's always we want to see another insert already existing franchise. And as I was like finishing reading my third or fourth list, I was like, don't you guys want to see anything new? Something original? Yes, fucking hell. Anything has to be a fucking sequel. Everyone everyone depends on established, recognizable brands. Yeah, that's that's the sad thing. That I think that's one of the saddest things about this E3. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited for some of the things that they're coming out with, you know, like the un, maybe an Uncharted, perhaps maybe Half-Life 3, and of course Fallout 4. That's what I'm most excited for an announcement for, but the problem with that is, is that everything that everybody's buzzing about at E3 is like, you know, Halo 5, the next Uncharted game, the next Half-Life game. It's all a continuation of a series, and there's nothing new. I mean, the only thing new I can think of is hopefully we get a little more, you know, gameplay and in-depth about No Man's Sky. Yeah, but besides that, it's like, and again, if it's there's nothing wrong with a sequel if it's a sequel that actually improves upon the original or continues the storyline and whatnot, but the fact that you literally had half a dozen articles excited over the prospect of a new Need for Speed game. It's like, what do you expect to be different this time around? Yes, it's a reboot. Big fucking deal. Well, no, I don't have much to say about, uh, well, so far, at least, about E3 and stuff, because I uh, I don't often keep up with E3 because half the time it's not interesting to me. So <laughs> We understand you're above video games. They're for children. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The problem is that I only play Silent Hill and Pokemon, so... <laughs> well, my, my biggest problem with a E3 has always been that they never really show you anything that's coming out this year. Yeah! <laughs> this is true, like, by the way. In, in the future, we're going to release God of War 3. I, I remember that being a big thing, and it's like two years later, it's like, oh, well, okay. Well, this is another problem that I had with the aforementioned, uh, you know, top ten list. The fact that a lot of the games, like fi a good 50 or 60 percent of the games that were featured on those lists, I was like, hey, we're looking forward to, remember The Division, uh, the game about Benjamin Franklin and whatnot, the post yeah, the, the yeah, game. Yeah, it was, it was the post-financial crash of America by Tom Clancy, I guess. Yeah, and when I saw that game pop up on that list, I was like, it's still not done? Are you going to see yeah, it Yeah, and that was, that was two fucking years ago. Yeah. That, was, that was our first E3 uh, rant. Mm -hmm. For a third year in a row, we're gonna see trailers for the exact same fucking games again. Jesus, maybe Christ. maybe Konami's actually got their idea if they can't fucking make their games on time because of overproduction. Yeah, oh, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna make smartphone games because it's just easier and we make a shit ton more money versus you know making a new uh, I don't know. Lords of Shadow game or something like that. Yeah. Well, I think uh, one of the problems, of course, is uh, once again the bloated budget because you know Telltale is somehow able to release uh, two game series a year. You don't, you know, have this like three or four year long development uh, development gap between them. Like um, Double Fine. <laughs> well, but let's set up Double Fine better. Yeah, Broken Age Two. Not a single new fucking location a year and a half afterwards. Jesus fucking Christ. I still, I still have yet to play the second half of that game. Not that I'm really rushing to do it. I've read the reviews, and, and apparently it's the most anticlimactic ending. Like, nothing gets resolved. No characters actually... Like None of them have any sort of arc. All the interesting threads, plot threads, that are started in Episode 1 are pretty much abandoned in Episode 2 in favor of a cheap Disney-esque ending. Oh, fuck that, then. I mean, if you can't do it, if you can't create a, an arc, character arc out of what they did in the first Broken Age... Uh, no, there's no hope. What it seems akin to to me is it, it, it's like, you know, it's like the player base is a horse and they're just dangling this great big carrot in front of you, but then by the time they finally decide to let you have the carrot, it's all rotted inside, and you're like, where's the carrot I was promised? <laughs> That's pretty true, actually. <laughs> That's true. So what so, other games... Oh. Yes, E3. No, I was going to say, so E3. Uh, well, with yeah. E3, um, they're releasing another, what is it, Frostbite? Uh, engine game. I want to say Matt, the new Mass Effect will be released from Frostbite, which is strange because Bioware only hopped onto Frostbite because they thought it would be impossible to mod. That's why they made Dragon Age Inquisition. Also, you know, to follow along with the franchise. So why they decided to stay with it, 
when they found out it could be very easily modded, I don't know. Maybe they don't have enough money to move on to another game engine. But mm, haven't heard anything about that yet. Looking it up. Yep. What about the uh, seemingly bleak future of Nintendo at this point? I mean, pretty much the only thing right now I can think of that has Nintendo still going is the fact that everybody's super psyched for the new open-world Zelda game, but they've already come out and openly said there's going to be nothing about that Zelda game at E3. Mm. I have, That's actually I interesting have because a lot of the aforementioned lists had Zelda uh, as one of their top contenders. Like, I want to hear about the new Zelda game, but if Zelda is not even going to be there, uh, what are they going to show? If I can Splatoon again? They're probably not going to talk about Pokémon for at least another year. Hmm. Uh, in which case, well, is Nintendo actually? Uh, because again, I've been out of the loop. But is Nintendo actually going to E3, or is it going to be another, you know, Nintendo Direct stream type of thing? That's a good question. I've not paid. I was hoping for an that... answer, not a validation of my question. But <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Let's look up if they're actually going to be there. Well, wow. yeah, while everyone's I'm... fucking googling. <laughs> well, yeah, silent. like that's that is a good question though because, um, yeah, I can't really think of anything recently that uh, Nintendo's been like actively um, promoting or working on besides uh, Splatoon or anything like that. Like besides their Nintendo creators program, because they got to well, save enough money somehow. Yeah, but that's that's not a game though. That doesn't like that doesn't really count, you know. Like I know, I'm that's just a joke. joke. Yeah, that's go joking, away. Yes. <laughs> I was making a joke that that's how they're getting their, the mass of their revenue these days is by, well, you know, yeah. chipping in on YouTube channels. Well, yeah, see, I'm, I'm trying to be serious here and actually try and think about oh, that was your stuff first that they're mistake. doing, but... <laughs> yes, that yeah. was your first mistake. No, oh, well, okay, I, I'll just shut up then. I'll go back it, to the kitchen. <laughs> digital event. It says Nintendo will be holding a digital event on Tuesday. Oh, uh, there we go. Of course. So they're not even Sounds be familiar. going to be... Oh. Well, which would be fine if they had more games to present. I don't care for a flashy stage show myself. And, I, and the last thing I want is for Robot you know, another, again. Uh, that too. And another, th and I don't want another year of an hour-long presentation about demographics and statistics and how we are going to make a gamer out of everyone. Uh, <laughs> how about you start making some games to begin with? Well, but yeah. why do they, need, they don't need to make games, Max? Because they have all their characters in Smash Brothers. <laughs> It, it, it's just like Konami. It requires less effort. Mm, that's true, but again, you know, the latest Super Smash Bros. game has been released. People have played it, and uh, now what, Nintendo? Well, now everybody's saying, where's our new Zelda? Where's our new Metroid? And I honest, honestly, this is Splatoon, even though... Has Splatoon come out yet? I don't, know, I don't own a Wii, so I wouldn't know. Um... I don't think anybody like does. Demo? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, wasn't there like some kind of like demo thing or something that was going on, and then it was like only available to play at like ridiculous hours at night or something? Probably. And it was probably another timed demo too. Even if you didn't yeah. play all of it, you only allowed twelve hours. From yeah, the, I think you got the email to the very end. Yeah, I That's think it. That it was. I can't. Yeah, I can't, I'm not gonna say like. I, I feel. I feel like it was like four hours of gameplay or something like total, but I can't remember exactly. So don't quote me on that. But yeah, I remember hearing about that. That um, it was like Splatoon is gonna be available for like play. It's like a demo, like between this and this time and this like crazy hour at night, and then between this and this time and another crazy hour at night. Have fun. And it's like okay. Unless they want to bring out like the Mario Maker. Oh yeah, that fucking genius game. Oh, boy. You can officially do what modders have been doing for. Almost like a, a decade, decade now. <laughs> yeah. At least in the case of Splatoon, I mean, Nintendo's at least exploring new ground. I mean, that that's more than you can say for most of the games that they do. That is true. the 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 ground gaining aspect of of Splatoon actually looks pretty interesting. How you got to paint your way and that kind of like advances your line. Um, it 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 does have a a certain appeal to it. It does look all right in my opinion. Max is price and they're you know. Uh, Splatoon. Well, it's an interesting. Concept. New feature concept, yeah, but I'd rather it's like, they... Max. It's something new. That's what matters. It's something yeah, but fucking it's a multiplayer new. Game. It's gonna have a single player campaign, but you know, Nintendo isn't known for their multiplayer experience, so that kind of makes me a bit of like I like I said, Nintendo goes together with the internet like oil and water. <laughs> and the other That's... issue is if it will actually work. I mean, Bold Star for the attempt, but if they can't make it succeed, other companies might not want to make that same risk. 
That's true. Plus all the other games that they presented on the last year's E3, like a new Yoshi game and Captain Toad, etc. Once again, like in the case of Sony and Microsoft, we've yet to see any of those games actually come out. We still have yet to see any new Star Fox games. Yeah, and see, this is what I'm wondering is, is the, the Star Fox game... The odd thing is, is if you look at like you know the Captain Toad and like the old the previous Donkey Kong games like Tropical Freeze or whatever it was, and even Star Fox, these aren't multi-million dollar budget games. These aren't like you know the Call of Duty massive AAA features. I mean, they're they're great games. I, I admit this, but um, you think that this would be something that they could almost hash out every year? Well, if you only have three or four decent games per generation, you might want to stretch them out a little bit. You well, know. What I'm saying is they're, they're, they should be easier to produce for Nintendo. Yeah, they should be, but if, you know, that's all the ideas they have at this point. Well, what they should do is they, they should be going back... Uh, I guess what I was going to talk to Kenny about in a possible future after hours uh, about that Nintendo Champions thing is I was going to um, bring up the possibility that... Uh, Nintendo should go back to their back catalog, like their old NES days, which is kind of what it harkened to the the championship thing is. is It's a blast from the past in the 90s. And take a look at all these IPs that aren't being used, like Mega Man, for instance, and now Castlevania. Maybe they should start saying, hey, you know, Konami, can we get some, like, 2D, you know, classic indie indie feeling games that aren't really, like, you know, massive, huge, big-budget 3D spectacles, though, but they're just fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, just 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 get these types of games out there, and you'd have people lined up around the block to get more Nintendo because yeah. they have they have all these iconic uh, iconic franchises in iconic you know uh, uh, formats. Like you know, if they go back to like classic Castlevania look, or if they you know do like classic Mega Man or Mega Man X. They have done that in the past, by the way. I remember on the Wii, um, there were two games. The first one was Contra Rebirth, and the second one was Castlevania Rebirth, which were done. They were short, you know, downloadable titles, which were done in association with uh, Konami, and they were released on the Wii Virtual, whatever that their online service was called. But the problem is there was no buzz about them. There was no marketing about them, which is why I don't think a lot of people even know about them. And I've played the Castlevania game, and it's... About them. First time I've ever heard about them. Yeah, and, and I, I think Nintendo needs to really like get its marketing game up. I mean, if if they have an exclusive Mega Man game, which people have been begging Capcom to make more mm-hmm. more Mega Man games, um, if they have an exclusive Mega Man game, they need to hype the shit out of that. I mean, you guys remember how Mega Man Nine and well, maybe not so much Ten though. But remember how Mega Man Mega Man Nine did? Yeah, that was that was oh. huge because it went back to the old pixel look and pixel feel. And well, also look at Mighty Number no. Nine. The fact that 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 was a successful Kickstarter campaign. So there is a demand for those kinds of games, but for whatever reason, Nintendo is too embarrassed to go back to their roots. I suppose. I think well, they're starting. Saying... Well, yeah. As a as I'm typing in the in the side chat here, I mean, like that's that. I think I feel like that's part of the issue is that they're they're not really amping up the advertising for these games, and so then they don't sell well, and then Nintendo turns around and is like, oh, well, the games didn't sell well, so people must not want them. And it's like, no, if people knew about them, they would want them, but you're not you're not taking the steps to actually, you know, get the information out there that, hey, look at this thing that we brought back, this old IP, isn't this real cool? And then people would actually go buy it, you know? It's like yes. they're digging their own grave. Yes, and perhaps if a Let's Player were to play the Castlevania Rebirth game and spread the word, hmm... As in, I'm referencing the After Hours that was released yesterday about the benefits of, you know, viral marketing (laughs) and whatnot. Okay, crickets. Wonderful. I'm going to shut up. (laughs) I think one thing that it's not necessarily just advertisements, but it's also they undervalue the nostalgia factor in terms of marketing. Everybody, especially today, is like, oh, do you remember this show? And hopefully they'll reboot it. Um, then there have been a few really notable failures, such as Thundercats. They tried revamping that, and it didn't even get past episode six, I think, before it crashed. Well, the furries like at... it for sure, but besides that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but everyone else, they didn't really pay too much about it. Um, if they brought back the same sort of nostalgia factor like they did for the latest Pokemon game, I don't think anybody can really forget the hype train that happened in 2014, 2013. You couldn't go to a website without seeing something about it. If they were to bring back 
some of the old characters from old games in their movies, not just main characters, not just IPs, but also like, you remember this event? We're going to recreate it and add a twist. That's exactly, like the regular the championship. Thing. Yeah, that's something that people would just eat up, and they have to market it, and they're not. That's the unfortunate thing. Yeah, because I'm I'm just thinking if they may if they went up to like uh, I think it's like Tecmo, um, and they asked for like a classic 2D Ninja Gaiden game that had like maybe like a NES feel or maybe just slightly updated. It doesn't have to be 3D. Pixels are awesome, in my my opinion. And they said they're gonna you know make like Ninja Gaiden 4, the old old school NES type. Oh man, I'd snatch it up in a fucking minute. I would say there's a pretty good market for that, at least in the sort of mainstream indie section, if that yes, makes that, sense. That's exactly it. Is that's, that's what Steam has been capitalizing on, is a lot of the nostalgia. Um, if you look at, like, Shovel Knight, if you look at um, Meat Boy and Binding of Isaac and uh, these types of very, very simple games, games created by, like, a handful of people, like, you know, two or three programmers and a designer and maybe a musician. Um, I can't imagine, you know, Meat Boy having too much, uh, that, that much of a, of a, of a staff to... Um, you know, shovel money at necessarily, but uh, they've made some amazing games that people just gobbled up, and all, it, it, they don't have to be these multi-million dollar games. They just need to be good games, and Nintendo needs to get back to doing that. They need to promote the maybe a smaller a smaller form factor. I, I don't know exactly what to call it, but they just need to get back to kind of exploiting this exact same, not necessarily nostalgia though, but just you know, quicker, simpler, funner games like Steam has. Yeah, so they're basically in the mentality of bigger is better. So like if their budget is bigger and if they spend more time making it bigger, it should be better. But that's right. not and always that, the case. That, exactly. And that's why I think they're doing that that, you know, giant sandbox Zelda game, which I don't think they really need to do. But I could be wrong. I think the formula that they're missing is if if you take a look at just how widely popular like smartphone and tablet apps and games have become is it hits the nail right on the head that nowadays the, the people's attention spans just aren't you know as complex as they used to be and you get more of a enjoyable experience from the shorter games with a little more rewarding kind of like games you know like Shovel Knight, Mario, the old sort of formula that they did with things and that was what Nintendo was good at and I think they need to do that again. I, I think that they just need to get back to just you know. Uh, Maybe making just slightly simpler games, just to just to build up their library. That's the big one. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like, I mean, and they they are sort of building the library, but I mean, like with with Splatoon, it's like that's only one new IP. I mean, like they could instead of putting like you know putting all their cards on the table with Splatoon, they could have you know taken taken all the time they're using for that and kind of split it between maybe two projects instead, and then we'd have two new IPs, but instead it's just one single thing, you know? And it's on a system that not a lot of people have to begin with, which is, that also is not helping them at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, didn't, like, Sony either last year or the year before, didn't they have, like, a successful campaign where they decided to hire a bunch of indie, guy, indie guys to make uh, a series of indie games for exclusively for the PSN service? Uh, I honestly don't see why Nintendo cannot do the same thing and say, like, hey, we're interested in reviving the NES slash SNES feel, so if there are more guys like the, the whoever made the Shovel Knight, and if you want to jump on board, by all means, we're going to you know finance you, we're going to sponsor you, as long as you know our, your games are exclusive to the Wii U service. That would be a, a very wise move. Uh, but again, you know, as we said before, before we started this chat, the, the golden rule with the gaming industry these days seems to be, if it makes too much sense, ah, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, no fucking shit. Again, I, I see the indie scene is able to better sustain itself mm -hmm. than the AAA industry can at this moment. That's why EA relies on their fucking sp sports franchises, which we know EA is, again, this E3 is going to be nothing but fucking football, basketball, and FIFA. This year, 65% improved dribbling. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Now the characters <laughs> blink. <laughs> it's, it's it's just like George Lucas and those fucking Ewoks, right? <laughs> the big update the big update is that the Ewoks now blink. Yes, they could just keep trying to polish the same turd over and over again. Well, that's what uh, I feel like they're doing, and that's what I feel like a lot of the actual game industry is doing. I mean, you don't really see a whole lot of innovation from any of these major publishers. You see sequels, 
You see mm-hmm. sequels to their biggest games. You know, Dead Space 3, uh, the next Call of Duty game, the next Battlefield game. Uh, it comes to a point where apparently they're devoting so much time, money, and manpower into certain IPs because they're the only ones that they are for sure, that they for sure know will sell. Everything yes. else is just a total crapshoot, and they don't want to gamble on these crapshoots. And of course, the problem is not every single game has to be a GTA 5 or a Co of Duty Modern Warfare yes, 3. Yes, that's not exactly every... it. Yes, not every single. Just because those games, you know, broke the records and whatnot, that's great. But they have a very specific audience. It doesn't mean that you have to take another type of game and try to modify it to, you know, capture that Call of Duty audience. Because uh, guess what? If the Call of Duty audience enjoys playing the Call of Duty games, they're not going to suddenly jump ship to a low-rent uh, copy slash facsimile of, of Call of Duty if there's the real thing coming out within a year. Uh, because, again, that's another thing, you know, another positive thing you might say about Activision or whoever makes the Call of Duty series is that there is actually a new game pretty much every single year. So perhaps that's something that Nintendo and uh, Sony and Microsoft can learn from those guys. Supply and demand. Yes, if Nintendo would just supply a smaller, possibly simpler games and make more of them, they would have a much more vibrant library. And it'd be something that'd be way more enticing for gamers like myself to go out and get a Wii. A Wii exactly. U, sorry. Or the next console that they're purportedly working on. The They don't Project need another NX. console. They just need to make games for the fucking consoles they got. <laughs> I understand that, but again, you know, for all their claims that Nintendo is trying to listen to hearken to the consumers and whatnot, uh, it doesn't seem it, it does seem like there's a certain distance between what the fans want and what Nintendo thinks the fans want. 